session this off um, on basic ECGs. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity and the invitation for me to present this to you um, this afternoon. Um, just before we start, as you know, or as you have seen here or heard, um, this session will be recorded. Um, so it will be available for you later on. And then obviously everything that happens in today's presentation will be on the recording. Um, yeah, so basic ECGs really is, is quite a lengthy topic um, with a lot of um, information, um, which we will need to cover in a very short period of time. So I do hope that I will be able able to at least give you some idea and some refreshments on, on basic ECGs, how do they originate, um, what the importance thereof is, um, a little bit a few steps of how do we go about when we interpret them, and then also some of the basic ECGs that we might see in the emergency center. Okay, so just before I start with the presentation. <laughs> Just quickly to say hi to everyone and then I'll switch off my camera for sake of bandwidth and connectivity because we are scattered, scattered all over Africa. So my name is Sandal De Lange. Um, I am an emergency nurse. I work in Cape Town, um, South Africa um, at Stellenbosch University um, in the emergency nursing program. And I also still um, help out in facilities around the Cape. So welcome to this afternoon session. And as I said, I do hope that the short presentation will be very beneficial for all of you to take back into your practice. Okay, so start off. Just quickly move the slides. Okay. So in this afternoon session, um, we will briefly look a little um, at the physiology of the conduction system of the heart, because that is quite an important thing for us to take into consideration and now how the different complexes on the ECG rhythm strips and are generated to help us better understand rhythms as well as abnormalities. Then we will look at the um, ECG itself, the recording and the interpretation there. Often, we, like I said, we'll look at a few of the sinus, atrial and ventricular rhythms um, that we most um, commonly see in the um, emergency setting. Okay, so as a little bit of an introduction, so um, the ECG, as we all know, is the recording of the ECG and the um, electrical activity of the heart. And the recording of the ECG and the ECG mon monitoring is something that we regularly do in the emergency center on all of our patients that arrive there, as well as during their duration of stay, um, both for our critical and even non-critical um, ill or injured patients that we look after. Okay. Why do we do it? So indications, usually for those patients with chest pain, um, if we um, see any arrhythmias on the cardiac monitor, we will need to do an ECG for further investigation. Whenever there's a change in the vital signs of a patient, to uh, see where does this change in vital signs originate? Is it cardiac related or is it something else that we need to investigate? We do it routinely on admission um, of all patients in some um, institutions or departments. Um, also more in, in the nursing field, we also do it on all the preoperative high-risk patients. So if you perhaps like work in a setting where you also need to prepare your patients going to theater immediately from your emergency department, um, you need to do those on preoperatively um, high-risk patients. And then all, whenever we have any autonomic signs and symptoms in a patient, so if there's a complaint of syncope, episodes of fainting, um, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, those are the types of things that we also um, might need to exclude um, any cardiac um, origin for those signs and symptoms. Okay. So just very quickly recapping the electrical conduction system of the heart. And as I said, in, in, for us to um, understand um, different ECG rhythms, it is important that you know how each of the complexes on the rhythm strip is formed. And that that will also help us to better then understand how abnormal rhythms are formed, what um, 
these are where exactly in the heart is it the atrial atrium problem is it the ventricular problem depending on where we see the abnormality on the rhythm strip um, and that is why we just need to very quickly revise um, the um, electrical conduction system of the heart um, which in basic um, plain terms is just how impulses travels throughout the different areas inside um, our heart Okay, so as we know, we have the SA node, which is the pacemaker of the heart situated in the atrium. And the SA node is also known as the pacemaker of the heart. It consists of small little specialized cells. And these little cells fire out impulses and they start generating a specific rhythm for atrial and ventricular contraction to commence. So in a normal sinus rhythm with a patient without any... Um, cardiac conditions, um, the SA node will fire out impulses at the rate of 60 beats per minute. And that's why we have a normal heart rate usually of 60 beats per minute. Okay, from there, um, once the SA node... Can we just ask that everyone just mute? Thank you. So as they fire out their impulses, atrial contraction will commence and the impulse will travel through to the AV node, which is situated just at the bottom of the atrium before it goes into the ventricles. And they transmit um, impulses from the atrium to the ventricle. Usually as soon as the impulse arrives at the AV node, it will be delayed for a very short period of time, like a 0.1 second. And then um, that will allow for full atrial um, contraction and for both of the atriums to fully contract. Okay. After that, the impulse will move over into the bundle of his, um, um, into the left and right bundle branches, which will then split off into the Purkinje fibers. And these are located right at the bottom of the ventricles. And so as the um, impulse travels through the bundle of his and into the Purkinje fibers, it allows for full ventricular contractions and for both of the ventricles to contract. And um, then we have ventricular depolarization. Okay, then your impulse will then leave the Purkinje fibers, it goes out, and then we have complete atrial repolarization, and then the whole process starts again. So on um, as soon as we have atrial contraction, we usually get the formation of our P waves um, with um, at the AV node where the impulse is delayed for a few seconds, that is what forms our PR interval on our ECG. Um, rhythm. Um, the QRS complex is formed during ventricular depolarization or when the ventricles um, contract and um, the R wave at the end is um, um, produced when we have complete um, uh, ventricular repolarization. Okay, so that we know now that as soon as you see anything, for example, there's a problem, there's a prolonged PR interval, then we do know that there's a problem at the AV node and our impulses are delayed longer at the AV node than what it should be, for example. Okay, All right, but before we can start actually interpreting our um, ECG rhythm, now that we know how it is formed, we also need to make sure that we have a good quality ECG. So a few things that we always should keep in mind here is, um, that we should always attempt to attain, obtain a good quality ECG. We should not have any evidence of artifacts. And there's a very nice example for you here at the top of what an artifact would look like. And that would be really, very difficult to interpret any complexes if your rhythms of your, your ECG looks like that. Then we also do not want any interferences, like you can see at the bottom, which makes it a very broad complexes. And it is really um, difficult to determine, especially something like the ST segment. Is it on the isoelectrical line or is it actually um, elevated or depressed? Yeah. Okay. Then we also want our baseline to be a straight line on the ECG. We do not want it to look like here at the left bottom side where you will see the wandering baseline because that also makes it difficult to interpret your ST segment elevations or depressions. 
stay. Then we should always have all of our leads connected so that all of the different components could be displayed on the ECG. We all know if one of our leads pops off, we print the ECG, then you will just have stipple lines on your ECG. So do make sure that all of the leads are connected and that we have clear complexes. So if you've taken the ECG before you remove your leads, make sure I can see all the complexes, no interferences, no artifacts. There is no wandering baselines. I can see all the different components and then only disconnect um, your, your ECG leads. Okay. Another important um, um, aspect of ECG qual um, quality is um, calibration. Yeah, so we all know our different ECG machines, they have this little block that you can see here on the left-hand side of the rhythm strip that can indicate that your ECG machine has been calibrated, um, meaning that every one millivolt on your ECG um, will be equivalent to 10 um, millimeters, and that will help you later on when you need to interpret your ECG. Okay. Always make sure that you have your paper speed set at 25 millimeters per second, and that is also usually indicated at the bottom of your ECG page. Um, and speed basically um, is important when we interpret the ECG, it might look like our rhythm is a very fast rhythm and we might interpret it as a tachycardia when in fact our speed was just very fast. Okay, and then also vice versa for a, for a bradycardia if your speed was too slow. Yeah, so always um, also check that. Um, most of the time, calibration and paper speed are settings that we are not going to fiddle with and adjust, but you never know the person that has used the machine in front of you if they maybe made some adjustments. Yeah. Okay. Then um, an important thing for us when we are going to interpret our ECG. So if we have a good calibrated ECG machine with a good quality ECG, then um, it will generate the normal complexes for us with um, accurate information on the ECG with regards to amplitude of the waves. And this is important, um, as I mentioned earlier, when we interpret our ECGs. So when we look at interpretation of the ECGs, you will see that we are very much going to work with the different blocks that we have on our ECG paper. And um, this is important when we start counting, né, that we are familiar with what is the size of these different blocks that I see on my um, ECG um, uh, uh, paper. Né? So if I just want to... Um, quickly show you. So on our ECG um, um, uh, papers, we usually see, like if you can see here that where I'm trying to draw for you in green. <laughs> okay, we usually have these big red blocks on ECGs that I'm sure that you have all seen before. And um, me. Okay. And the one big block on our ECG paper always has a lot of small little blocks on the inside. Yeah. So you can see here, um, again, in the blue, there's a lot of these little blue blocks on the inside. Yeah. So one big red block, which is now green on, on our screen, is usually um, five millimeters long. Né? or the same as 0 0.2 seconds né? or 0 0.20 seconds. And if I look on the inside of this block, I will see that I see um, five small little blocks. In each big block, there will be five small little blocks next to one another. And each one of these small little blocks will then be equivalent to a 0 0.04 seconds. Né? And that is 0 0.04 times five, gives me a 0 0.20, and that is what one big block is like. Yeah. Okay, so this is some important information to take into account when we start um, measuring the different comp complexes, like the P wave, the PR interval, especially, um, and then also the QRS complex as we go along on um, our ECG um, interpretation. Okay, so this is just to show you what does one of those big red blocks look like? 
in in enlarged versions né? so we said one large block is um equal to 0 0.20 seconds with one small little block um 0 0.04 seconds there's five of them um and that equals then to to uh, 0 0.20 seconds and then if we look vertically one large block will be equivalent to a 0 0.5 millivolts or 0 0.5 millivolts but that is something in nursing that we do not always take into consideration will be the vertical measurements. Né? Um, vertically is more when we want to go and look at um, indications of um, conditions like hyperkalemia, for example. Okay. So on our um, ECG um, paper, we are now already said that we can see different components if we have a good quality ECG. So usually our ECG consists out of uh, P waves, of PR intervals, QRS comple uh, complexes, ST segments, as well as T waves. Um, so you are all, we, as we, when we discussed um, earlier the different electrical um, activities of the heart, um, we already heard during the conduction system how the, each of these components are formed and each of them represent then a certain mechanical activity that occurs in the heart. Yeah. So just to recap, as we said, P wave is an arterial, arterial atrial depolarization. The PR interval is where we have the delay of the impulse at the AV node. QRS complex is where we have ventricular depolarization, and then the T wave is where we have ventricular repolarization. Okay. So what should each of these components look like? And this is here where we are going to start taking into account our measurements, counting the big blocks and the small blocks. So each P wave on a normal sinus rhythm ECG where I have no for, um, abnormalities. My P wave should always be small. It's you upright and it usually has a little rounded shape. Okay. In front of every QRS complex, I should see a P wave. If I don't see a P wave, it means that there's something wrong during atrial um, contraction and that with the initiation of the impulse from the SA node, somehow it start, doesn't travel through, and that is what is causing um, my P wave abnormality on my ECG. Then the PR interval, like we starts from the beginning of the P wave right up until the start of the QRS complex. So that whole part is your PR interval. A normal, a normal PR interval should be anything between a 0 0.12 and a 0 0.20 seconds. Yeah. So that means anything between three to five little small blockies. Yeah. Okay. Or, or um, uh, in length, it should be a maximum of a big full, uh, a full big block. Okay. In the QRS complex, um, um, we measure that at from the start of the Q wave up until the end of the S, and that should then be anything between 0 0.12 seconds to oh, 0 0.06 seconds. My apologies <laughs> to 0 0.12 seconds. Nee, so anything between. Um, a one and a half to um, three little small blocks. Okay, then the T wave, that starts after the QRS complex and that should always be in an upright position. We should never want to see inverted T waves. And then in between the QRS complex and the T wave, that, that little flat line part that you see is what we call the ST segment. Okay, and that, um, should always be on the isoelectric line. So when I draw a line with my ruler from the start of my QRS right through to the end of the T wave, basically that is the segment should be on the line, the ruler line that you have just drawn. Okay. And then the last part is the QT interval. So this starts from the start of the um, Q wave or the QRS complex, and then it continues right up until the end of our T wave. And that should be anything between 0 0.36 
to a 0 0.44 um, seconds. And these are usually when we want to, usually in those patients with tricyclic antidepressant overdoses, those are usually the patients where we might ex um, see prolonged QT. Um, intervals, for example. Okay, so if we look at the graphical depiction of these different components, you can see very nicely here. Um, and I will um, oh, try and use my drawing skills again. So when we look at the P wave, so that is that first little wave that we oh no, that we see uh, over there, and this is that one there that we want to see a rounded upright um, shape and in front of the QRS complex. Okay. Then we can see our PR interval starting from the start of the P right up until there where the QRS complex starts. And that little area there in between is the area that you will measure and count the small little blocks that you can see in between in order to determine if it's between 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. Okay. Um, then we also have the QRS complex or the QR um, of the QRS interval, QRS complex, <laughs> and easy to say from where the Q, easy to measure, sorry, where the QR Q wave starts right until here where the S wave comes back. And that whole part over there, small little blocks that you count in between those two lines, and that will give you the value of your, your QRS um, segment. And then after that, that little line that you can see over there is where our ST segment is. And that is what we always want to be on the isoelectric line. And then lastly, our T wave, always in an upright position. And then QT interval, right from the start of the Q, right until the end of the T wave. Count the small little blocks in between, and that will give you the value of your QT interval. So I always tell, and this is what, the people that wants to start interpretation of ECGs and it looks very daunting, it looks very difficult. And this is how we were taught. And I always like to also teach our students the same is that draw your lines on your ECG, make a copy, draw your lines with the different segments, count your little blocks in between. Um, and then you can know that you can never make a mistake. Nee. Um, I think even now, still these days, in order to make sure that I still do a correct ECG interpretation, I will still go and draw my lines. Now, not on the ECG that you will find in the file, <laughs> but on a separate ECG so that I can clearly make sure that I do not make a mistake and say that, you yes, see, this is a block, for example, when in the meantime it wasn't one because I just, you know, counted um blindly with the naked eye. Okay. Right, so now that we know the components, we know what they look like and what should be the normal values and we know how to measure them, we can look at how do we now interpret this whole thing. Okay, so important rule number one here is that practice makes perfect. So the more you do this, the more you will remember the normal values, you'll remember the steps, and it will also get easier and faster the more you do it. Yeah. Okay, and the second one is to follow your step-by-step -step approach. Yeah. So we know in emergency medicine, emergency nursing, we do like to follow our algorithms and guidelines because that is what helps to for us to, to maintain um, sanity in the chaos and the busy chaotic environment that we work in. Yeah. Okay, so same with ECG interpretation. If you follow the steps, you cannot miss anything and you will be able to interpret correctly. Yeah. So seven steps in rhythm interpretation. So step one, you will examine the rhythm. In step two, you will look at what is the rate. Third step, you will look at the P wave. Fourth, you will look at the PR interval. Fifth, look at the QRS complex. Six, look at the ST segment. And lastly, in step seven, we then formulate a final diagnosis. So we do not skip to step seven if we haven't done number one, two, and three. Okay. And that is where sometimes we do make a mistake is that we do not look at everything and then we want to make the final diagnosis because we are in a hurry. Okay. 
So if we look at step one, when we examine, examine the rhythm, so here is where we want to look at whether or not this rhythm is regular or irregular. And this we do by measuring the RR intervals. So on our ECG, we want the R or the space between the different R or waves should be the same. Okay. So you can measure this with a blank piece of paper and you can make little dots on them and you can move them from the next set to the next and you can see if it remains the same or you can take a ruler, measure the centimeters and make sure that the centimeters stay consistently the same. Okay. Then the next one is the, in step two, we want to determine the right. And for this, we have quite a few different um, tools that you can use to, de to determine the right. So the first one, you can um, measure the R or interval in millimeters. So you take your ruler, measure from the one R wave to the next R wave. Um, and you get that millimeters, or you go from one R interval R wave to the next R wave, you count the small little blocks that you can see in between. And then you take 1,500 and you divide it into that millimeters or that amount of small blocks that you've counted. And then that will give you your heart rate name. So this um, method is called the 1,500 method. So if I, for example, if you can look at this example that you can see here on your, on your screen, the start from the one R wave to the next R wave, that's your end point. Count the small little blocks in between. I count 50 little blocks. So I take 1,500, I divide that by 50 blocks, and then that gives me a heart rate of 50 beats per minute, for example. Okay. Otherwise, um, and this, this method you can use for both regular as well as irregular um, rhythms. Or what you can also do is if the distance measured um, between these one, one R wave to another R wave is 20 millimeters, then you take that 1,500, you divide it by 20, and um, you get a heart rate of 75 beats per minute. Okay. And um, this one, like I said, irregular and irregular, but it's all, but it is specifically very helpful to use in irregular um, rhythms where the diff distance between the different R waves is going to change. So that gives you a more consistent type of um, a heart rate than the other methods that we are going to look at. Okay. Then we can also use the six second um, strip method. And I think this is something that we, a lot of people use quite often. Um, so on your ECG, um, you can you take 30 large um, blocks. Nee? You count 30 large blocks in a row. That gives you a six, six second strip. Nee? So then you can mark where the 30 blocks end. You can mark that on your, your ECG paper. Then you count the amount of QR, QRS complexes or the amount of R waves that you can see in those 30 large blocks or in that second, um, six second strip. Count the amount of R waves that you can see. Then you take that amount of R waves, you multiply it by 10, and that will then give you your R rate. Okay. So if, for example, you have seen nine R waves né, on, your, on your six second strip, Multiplied by 10 gives you a heart rate of 90 beats per minute. Okay, so this example that you can see here um, is uh, just an example of those a six second strip. So we said that we've counted 30 blocks, although it's not really depicted like that, but we will pretend that there's 30 blocks. Um, we can see nine R waves, we multiply that by 10 and it gives you the heart rate. That very easy method and also an easy method to use for both regular and irregular um, rhythms. Okay. Then the last method that we are going to look at, no, second last method is the sequence method. And this method is unfortunately can only be used for regular rhythms. Now, so if you look at the example that you can see here on your right hand side, so you take um, your ECG paper and you find a R wave that is directly located on the red line. Nee. So for example, here, if I take my um, 
my my thing here. So we can see that R wave is directly on the on the red line. So we will start make that our start point. Okay. Then the first dark red line that you can see after that, you are going to start um, counting down. Now, so you'll start with three hundred. The next line will be 150, the next one will be 100, the next one will be 75, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 0. Okay, right. Then as soon as you've marked all of them, then you will look at the top here and you will look for where do I see is my next R wave. Okay. So the very next R wave after the one where you have started counting down. And then you look at the bottom here, so it's more or less just um, here. This R wave is one little small blocks block before a rate of 75. So this heart rate is more or less uh, 75 to 80 beats per minute. Okay. Um, and then that is then the sequence method. So because we count this 300 down method and we go and we look at we measure the very next R wave is where your heart rate will be if it's an irregular rhythm then obviously wherever whichever complex you start measuring at will differ from the next because if your R waves are closer to one another it will give you a different reading from where your R waves are a little bit further from one another and that is why then this method is not very ideal to, or shouldn't be used in your um, irregular rhythms okay and this is also a method that people do not like to use a lot because it can be quite complex to remember 300 150 175 um, and then also um, 50 60 40 30 going down then the last one, the 300 method, is also something that people do like to use. Um, so again, you locate one of the R waves that are either on or very close to a dark red line. Um, so like you can see here on your example. Then um, you calculate the amount of large blocks um, that you can find up until you get to the next R wave. Okay. So you can see there we've marked two R waves for you. Okay. And the amount of large blocks in between there is around about four, one, two, three, four large blocks, yes. Okay. So now I take 300, I divide it by those four large blocks that I've seen, and then I get a heart rate of 75 beats per minute. Okay, and you can use this in your regular rhythms. Okay, so this is something very easy. One more wave to the next, count the big blocks, divided by 300, and I get my, my heart rate. Okay, so always do remember whether or not it's regular or irregular, and then I calculate the rate depending on the best method that I want to use for a regular or an irregular heart rate, or whichever method I'm comfortable with. <laughs> um, that fits that specific rhythm. Okay. Then we will move over to assessing the P wave. So a normal P wave, we said they should be there. They should be there before every QRS complex. They should all like the same and they should always be in a rounded shape. So here is just an example to show, tell you or show you that nice rounded upright shape before the each and every QRS complex. Okay, then after that, I will measure my PR interval. So with the PR interval, um, we set from the beginning of the P to the start of the QRS complex. And that is the part I count the small little blocks in between and should be between 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. And remain importantly with a PR interval, I need to measure all the PR intervals on my rhythm strip. So everything that I see on lead two, I need to measure because I need to see does it consistently stay the same or is it perhaps three blocks in the first one, and then it goes to four blocks, then it goes to five blocks, then I do not see a PR interval, and then it starts again at three blocks. Okay, so I need to see if it consistently stays the same, because that will then tell me um, also that my PR interval is normal. 
But as soon as I start seeing that the PR interval is prolonged or that some of my um, PR, my um, the secure ACE complex without the POF in front, then it tells me that um, there's some sort of block starting to form, either a first or a second or a third degree, depending on what does the PR interval look like. Okay. Then the next component will be the QRS complex. And we said we measure it from the start of the Q up until the end of the S wave. It should be between 0 0.06 and 0 0.12 seconds. And um, that then depicts whether or not I have something wrong in the ventricles. So if I just see broad QRS complexes, like in your ventricular tachycardia rhythms, then I know somewhere um, the atriums are being overwhelmed by the amount of ventricular contraction that is happening. Okay. Then we are going to look at the ST segment. So here we said we want to measure that part. That line should be on the isoelectric line. Um, as soon as I see that, for example, there at the top of your the picture that's on your slide, you'll see is, there's an example of the ST elevation where that whole ST, ST segment is way above the isoelectric line, okay? Or I see a ST segment depression where this whole um, ST segment, and let me just quickly show you here. So when that whole part there is underneath my isoelectric line that lies there at the top. Next, so I can then clearly say I have a ST depression, okay? And same with elevation. I draw my line from the P wave right until the end of the T. And I see that this whole ST segment part is way above that line. So that indicates ST elevation. And this is where we are going to start um, querying things like our MIs or anginas or um, is um, STEMIs, in STEMIs, and those um, types of rhythms. Okay. Okay. So then, once we have now looked at all of the different components, we will then formulate a final diagnosis. Okay. Um, so if I have seen that all of my different components are within normal limits, so it means I have a rounded P wave, they all look the same. There's a P wave in front of each and every QRS complex. PR interval is consistently between 0 0.12 and 0 0.20 seconds. QRS complex is between 0 0.06 and 0 0.12 seconds. Um, and I have a, ST, a T wave at the end that is in an upright position, then I can say that I have a normal sinus rhythm. Usually the ST segment will not form part of um, the criteria to say that I have a normal sinus rhythm. So it can be that I have a sinus rhythm, but I have ST elevation or ST depression. So then my final diagnosis will just say that I have a normal sinus rhythm with ST elevations. Okay, so remember the, um, the elevation of the ST segment does not change whether or not this is a pradi or a tahi or a, a, a normal sinus rhythm. That is something that we have in addition. Okay, and usually that ST segment is most the part where it will tell us that our myocardium is actually struggling and it is not getting enough oxygen supply and the cardiac cells is actually starting to die off. And that is the part that we see on the ST segment. Okay, so if we just quickly look at a little bit of the sinus, atrial and ventricular rhythms. Okay, so we said... Um, I'll just briefly go through each one of them. So the sinus bradycardia is usually just when everything is normal on my rhythm strip, except the rate is less than 60 beats per minute. Okay. Um, sometimes this might be normal in patients like athletes um, or when patients are asleep or when they are in severe pain. All of these things can also then um, trigger the formation of a sinus bradycardia. So everything is normal, it's just the rate is slow, and that's why it's a sinus bradycardia. Okay. 
the anastachic area will be the opposite. Everything is normal except for a very fast rate this time. So anything above 100 beats per minute, but less than 150 beats per minute. Then, then I have the supraventricular tachycardia or a SVT. And this is usually where I have a very fast atrial rhythm. Okay, so um, this is just where the SI node sends out impulses so fast um, and it moves so fast through the AV node that we cannot have proper full atrial um, um, depolarization that occurs with every contraction. Okay, and usually here the base method to recognize this is that you will have a heart rate of anything between 150 to 250 beats per minute. Okay. And this can be um, present in patients with rheumatic heart disease in your acute MIs, if we have any um, digitalis toxicities or caffeine overdoses. Um, some of your drug overdoses can all um, trigger the um, SVT. Then the atrial flutter one. So this is usually where the SI node sends out their normal impulses at a rate of 60 beats per minute. But somewhere else in the atrium, there is another um, cell that is doing its own things. And they are also sending out another um, impulse. And this then um, forms this ectopic rhythm inside the atriums. And that's why our P waves now look funny. Now, so in the flutter, so what happens here is that our ventricles are normal. So the QRS complex X looks normal because there's normal ventricular depolarization, but the, vent, the, um, the atriums are not able to fully contract. And that is then what makes this fine, um, this um, sore tooth like um, or picket things like uh, P waves on your ECG. In atrial fibrillation, something that we see quite often in our elderly patients, same thing here, there's an atopic beat somewhere inside the atrial, um, in the atriums, and this then cause the, causes the atriums to not fully contract, but they only fibrillate, and that's why you see this fibrillation waves in between your QRS complexes. So normal QRS complexes, but there's no P waves and there's no PR intervals. Okay. Ventricular fibrillation. Um, this is the one that we should be worried about. <laughs> um, this is where somewhere inside the ventricles now we have abnormal cells sending out impulses on their own that are doing their own things and they just let the ventricles now fibrillate and there's not full ventricular contraction. Okay, and this then actually causes a right, the rhythm, the P waves and the PR intervals to be completely absent um, and even the QRS complexes. And these are the ones that we treat with CPR, we defibrillate and we give antiarrhythmic um, medications. Then we also get the ventricular tachycardias. So here, these are the ones that can either have a pulse or they can be without a pulse. And this is where we just have white, bizarre QRS complexes. So again, somewhere in the ventricles, cardiac cells are also sending out their own impulses together with the SI node. And that then may forms this bizarre ventricular complex because the ventricles cannot properly contract and relax. Um, for a um, sustained period of time. Okay, so this one, if there is um, a pulse, um, the heart rate will usually be around about 100 to more than 100 beats per minute. Um, and you will just see these broad QRS complexes. Okay, if there is no um, heart rate or you cannot feel a pulse and you see this rhythm, we know it's a pulseless ventricular tachycardia and then we initiate CPR, um, DVD fibrillate, we use our antiarrhythmic medications. Okay, then the asystole or the asystole are the ones that we do not want to see on our patients. <laughs> um, this is where we have complete ventricular um, standstill so we do not have any complexes generated on the heart because there is no um, conduction um, from 
the atriums to the ventricles, none of them are contracting or relaxing, and we then have a complete, what I call, almost a flat line. Yes, so we do not have a right, no rhythm, no P waves, no PR intervals, no QRS complexes, and we treat this with CPR and our um, adrenaline. We identify the cause, and we try and reverse um, our H's and T's. Okay. Right, so I think we might have a few seconds and um, just to have a little bit of an activity before we ask questions I would like for you guys um, to on your phone or the computer that you are using or whatever you are using if you will be able to go and log on to mentimeter.com and then as soon as you are on that website um, they will ask you for a code and you can then enter that code and you will be able to answer these just two little rhythm strips that you guys need to just go and identify and tell us um, what do you think is the rhythm. So it's just to go on to mentimeter.com and then you enter that code and um, then your, your questions will display there. Um, I can perhaps just go here and also share this with you. Oh, sorry, this one. <laughs> perhaps you can also see the questions on the screen. So if you just quickly need to look at this rhythm, we know we don't, <laughs> it's a bit difficult on the screen sometimes to really measure something, but just what you think. What do you think, what is the name of this specific rhythm? Are you guys able to access it? Oh, I see there is some some response. Okay, so there's one person that thinks this rhythm is a sign of tachycardia. Okay, so I can just quickly tell, so um, we can see that the ESP waves in front of every skewer is complex, um, they are nicely rounded shaped, they, are, um, they all look the same, they are in the upright position, if I look at the PR interval, it looks like it's more or less one, a little bit longer than one small block, no, one, two, three small blocks, so that gives me a normal one. A normal PR interval, QRS complex, um, that is about one, two blocks. So that also gives me a normal QRS complex. It's, um, and I have an upright T wave at the end. It's not inverted. So that then tells me this is actually a normal sinus rhythm. Now, it's also regular because these R waves are all equal distance from one another. And... Um, the right here, if I count one, two, three, four, five, six, six R waves that I can see, I take that, multiply it by my easiest method, multiply it by 10, gives me a rate of 60. So that means I have a normal sinus rhythm then actually. Okay. So then there is another, um, another rhythm that we can look at and I see that there's some of you that have already answered this one as a sinus bradycardia and this one is actually easy to see um all waves is quite far from one another if I take the big blocks in between these two all waves that we can see here that is about one two three four five six blocks in between so yeah that will give me a rate of about 30 beats per minute. I see P waves, P 
PR interval looks more or less the same constantly. Um, my QRS complex looks more or less the same. My T waves are there. So yes, I can say that this looks quite like a sinus bradycardia, which quite a lot of you have identified. Well done. Okay, so that is then all um, for, for my presentation on the ECG this afternoon. I know it was very fast and quite of a lot of information, but the presentation will be available. You can go through it again. Um, and yes, then I hope you guys are going to go out and practice and then practice will make perfect. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you very much for joining us today. We are grateful and want to welcome all you, all you back to our nursing webinar. Um, next month, we shall be announcing the next lecture. Please look out for the, the flyer and the information on the various platforms. Thank you, Santel, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, wish you all a very good day and enjoy the rest of the week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Very educating. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.